And this money is going to be spent on purchase of goods and services. So goods, for instance, for the pipeline, you'd talk about pipes, you'd talk about um, uh, uh, materials, wires, and instrumentation, that kind of the, the goods mm. that will be purchased. That kind of infrastructure. You will need food, you will need uh, uh, services like logistics, you need services like uh, waste management, you need services like caring and forwarding. Medical. So many services, medical, mm. legal, accounting, mm. all these services. Mm. And all the projects need all these services and the goods. Mm. Uh, people are going to come in to provide the services and they will need somebody to transport them, to feed them, to clothe them, to take care of their laundry. And all these are the services that are going to consume the 11 billion. And so as Ugandans, we must be able to take time mm. to understand the project, prepare ourselves, and participate in the provision of these goods and services. Mm. And so let's imagine uh, I own uh, a security company. Do I need to close the, to stop that business and go look for pipes? No. <laughs> <laughs> because security services are going to be required. Okay. So all I need to do is prepare myself, be mm. registered on the national supplier database, and bid to yeah. provide security to the project. Mm. It's, it's, it will be significant amounts of money. Mm. If I have apartments, I just need to put them to the standard that is required and ap avail the apartments for people to live in. Mm. Uh, and there will be a lot of money. I've seen a contract of upwards of 10 million in that particular space. Mm. And, and so uh, there are opportunities in everything. Mm. We'll be moving people between Kampala, Entebbe, Entebbe, the Graben, Hoi, Mavuris, mm. uh, But how are they going to be moving? Uh, you know Kant, Total, and Sinuk don't own a fleet of vehicles. Definitely. Somebody will have to provide the transportation. Mm. Uh, and so these are the opportunities that are there. Yeah. And uh, we've structured the law uh, to favor Ugandans mm. and Ugandan companies. So if we produce... Uh, s uh, if you produce anything in Uganda, it could be from food to aluminium to steel. If you're producing cement, all these things, and you're a Ugandan company, you have preference in mm. the procurement yeah. above all other entities in the world. Mm. So that is an advantage. The, the, boo -boo, the boo boo thing buy it's Uganda, build Uganda. It's right, more actually, or less of the same. It's, yeah, it, but actually, oil and gas was slightly ahead mm. of boo boo. We started national content way ahead of, um, of the, the, but it's good to have bubu. Mm. It, it's a good, pro, it's a good pro, uh, uh, pro process. Mm. So because the law uh, gives uh, priority to Ugandans, it is absolutely necessary that Ugandans prepare mm. and participate. Okay. Uh, quite interestingly, when one hears about oil, they might actually think it's a, a recent development. Mm -hmm. But from the archives, it's uh, well indicated and uh, documented that in 1925, the potential of Uganda to have petroleum was documented by geologist Wayland, and this was in the publication Petroleum in Uganda. 1925. Thereafter, a couple of interesting activities uh, came into the picture. 1936 to 1956, the African-European development companies drilling shallow wells in Butiaba, Chibiro, and Chibuku. Not any different from the same places that we are looking at even as of now. Uh, coming through 1985, the Petroleum Act was enacted. We can see how this has been coming through. And uh, going forward, bilateral intergovernment agreements coming into the picture the drc uganda 1990 agreements we also saw uh, a couple of others but as well uh, around 2015 the petroleum authority coming into place at one stage when we look at uh, aspects of uh, the pipeline which i want to believe uh, works are ongoing we are within uh, the documented 10 districts where it's supposed to go through before it uh, gets out of the country. Yeah. I want to know, how is the compensation of those people that uh, you know, have their land mm -hmm. as now the passageway for the pipeline? So the, the compensation uh, takes um, quite a very elaborate process. Mm. Uh, what, what we do is uh, uh, basically to follow, to follow international standards that are provided by International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank. Mm. But we also have our standards in Uganda. Yeah. And the idea is uh, initially for the project to identify the land that it requires. Mm. And that the pipeline project has done. Mm. So we know the corridor that it will require. Mm. And then the next process is to identify the owners of the land in that particular, of, that, of the land that has been identified. Mm. And you will find so many. 
And, and in Uganda, of course, you know, our land tenure system has different uh, 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 manifestations. It, yeah, so you'll it's, basically it's, be dealing it's, with it's all sorts of tenure, land tenure system. Mm. So you'll deal with the freehold, you'll deal with lease, you'll Leads. deal with the mm. Vivanja, you'll deal with all these. <laughs> but it's fine because yeah. we have established a kind of uh, a system mm. that allows us to manage that process very well. Mm. And once you've identified the, the, the owners mm. that we call project affected persons, uh, you go through a period of sensitization to tell them about the project, to tell them about how beneficial the project is, mm. and to tell them the requirement that we have for the land. Mm. And how, according to the constitution, they would be paid promptly and in a timely manner. Mm. And then once that is understood, that's the initial sensitization, yeah. we go through a process of valuation. Now, valuation is also very well regulated. And you have uh, the chief government valuer using a very scientific met methodology to value the land. Mm. And then the values will be discussed and uh, agreed. Mm. Once they are agreed between the, uh, the, the, the project affected person, now we go through a, project, a, a process of training these people to be able to manage money. Yeah. Those who accept, who choose to receive oh, yeah. money compensation. Mm. And the idea is from other projects all over the world, we've learned that uh, sometimes you compensate people, they get money, they don't manage it well, and they are worse off than mm. they were before the project. Mm. Our, our intention in the project is to make sure that people are better than they were when the project um, uh, came, came through their land. Mm. And so that's, what, that's the process we've gone through. Okay. And so we go through financial literacy classes. We hire an entity that we pay, and in the, in the, in the, in the case of, um, uh, of the pipeline, we've hi we hired the Centenary Bank, uh, which went through doing literacy training for our people. Mm -hmm. And we do this with um, families where there are uh, couples, a man, uh, a man and a woman married, mm -hmm. uh, where um, they have young people. So we, we group them. Mm -hmm. But uh, for couples, because that's where most of the problems have been, that uh, you compensate a man and then he just disappears and mm -hmm. the family is, is worse off. We train them, make sure that uh, they understand how to use money, what they're going to do with money, how to keep money in a bank. We open bank accounts for them. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> by the time you come to the tail end uh, of, of that process to pay the cash, you've prepared them mm -hmm. uh, to manage. Some people choose to just be allotted land somewhere else, yeah. given a house, mm. and uh, they, they, we do live level restoration. And maybe restoration. a top up just in case. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So for those, what we usually do is we aim at making sure they have a permanent house, they have uh, access to, uh, to utilities, u utilities, electricity, water, uh, majorly, they have, they have maybe communication. To, mm. to better san san sanitary provisions. Mm. But the, whole, the general principle is that they are better off than they were before. Mm. And we have many testimonies to that effect, that people have, people's lives have improved. Mm. But what we also do is, many times when you shift somebody from one place, uh, let's say th this person has been a fisherman, and you've taken him to a place that is not probably near the lake, mm. so they can't fish, you must make sure that, and monitor, mm. that they get into another economic activity that will uh, more or less give them the same or better revenue streams. Mm. So that's, that's the process. Now, that where we are at for the project is that we've finished all this sensitization, financial literacy training, and we're at the point where we're going to start now. We have opened accounts, but at the point now we're going to start paying uh, the cash compensations mm -hmm. for those that have chosen. I like I like it uh, if, if the description was money lessons. Mm -hmm. People are, are graduating in the money <laughs> studies. Uh, wh by the way, talking about uh, the pipeline, yes. there is always that uh, kind of query that people ask us when we do discussions of the kind. Mm -hmm. Once we are off the TV set uh, within the society, people will ask us, why a pipeline? Why not road? Mm -hmm. Why not uh, water? Why, why, why was it the pipeline that was chosen? The pipeline option. Okay, so... It's, it's an interesting question, mm. but it was chosen for three reasons. Mm. One is commercial. It is cheaper than road, than mm. rail. Mm. Two is safety. Safety, you know, crude oil is not a, is a hazardous product. Mm. So when you put it in trucks or you put it in, um, on a train uh, for 1,400... It's, it's exposed. Kilo kilometers, mm. you expose, you risk the, the entire population. Mm. Uh, along so, that so the route. pipeline is not seen at any one time? It mm. is... Uh, no, it's buried. You oh. won't see it. You won't even know that it is there. 
uh, because we'll have normal activities on, on, on top, oh, on, of, the on top of it. Yes, well, you, there will be crops, there will be uh, grass, there will be vegetation, so you won't be able to, to see the pipeline. Wow. So the pipeline is the safest mode of mm. transmission for our crude oil. Mm. The other element is that our crude oil, in terms of its composition, is uh, quite waxy. So its viscosity, it doesn't flow yeah. uh, unless it is uh, within a particular temperature. So thick. Yeah, so for it's easier to heat the pipeline than to heat a trailer to heat a train, mm. um, uh, uh, continuously hit many train, uh, tra train, train segments to, to go to the sea or many, or many, t or many trucks. Yeah. So the pipeline is easier to heat to mm. make sure that the crude continues to flow. Okay. And so based on that, we, we, we chose and decided that um, the pipeline was the best mode of transmission of the crude to the sea. Mm. And we also had uh, routes that we looked at, but we eventually chose the route uh, through, Tanga, through Tanzania to Tanga. Uh, because it was the least cost uh, route. Mm. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, I need to know as well, on behalf of uh, my dear viewer uh, who is watching us on UBC TV, as we do tackle this interesting talk, what next after the FID, the final investment decision? Yes. Final investment decisions. <laughs> uh, we need to know um, the local people. Yes. You, you, you talked about uh, how probably it's going to help people that are into building, into a health sector, and so many of the others. But I want to know if we were to break it down specifically, mm -hmm. what opportunities exist for the local people? And how will people around uh, the oil region in particular uh, benefit from the projects you just mentioned or made mention of? So uh, I'll still emphasize the two elements, mm. provision of goods and services. But I think for our young people, let me start with the young people. ICT. Employment. Employment. First of all, mm. In all categories of um, capabilities. So are you skilled in IT? Are you skilled? Are you a lawyer? Are you whatever mm. uh, profession you're in? You are required, and I'm sure you've seen adverts going out in the last uh, month, and they, they will continue to, to go out. Mm. So apply for these jobs, compete for them, and please take them and, and work hard and deliver on the projects. Because w the oil and gas industry is very interesting. Mm. Because when you get into it today, you can be, you can be recruited by Total Energies or Sinuk here. And you do an excellent job. And before you know it, they've taken you to another project in Nigeria or in Rwanda or in, 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 in Angola or in, in, um, in Algeria. So anywhere. Yeah. So you become an international player in the sector. Mm. So apply, put in effort, and make sure that you, 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 you get the jobs. But many times uh, uh, we, have, we have many of our young people who are not exactly skilled, and they are not accountants, they are not, <laughs> but they have gone to te technical institutions. Yeah. So they have technical skills. Mm. These are actually the ones most needed by the industry. Well, surprisingly, uh, we, 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 we will employ more people, more, more people in the blue collar category of, of, of skilling. Mm. So those who have technical skills, you are an electrician, you are, in all these technical skills, those who have gone to, have got certifications, even welders, Welder, yeah. uh, How's all about? these will be required. Mm. So that's an opportunity for employment. How about those who have no skill at all, but they have the capability and the will to work. Mm. Unskilled labor is absolutely required. If you go to Bulisa now, where the central processing facility is going to be. Mm. There's a lot of earthwork going on, and there are so many young men, unskilled, mm. but uh, energetic and willing to work, who are being employed. Be basically doing clerical work. E clerical, even mm. ma uh, manual work, uh, and uh, office work, and uh, stuff uh, mm. of that nature. Bella. And they, they, they are employed. So those mm. are the three categories of employment. And in our assessment, we are going to have uh, more than 160,000 people uh, in those three categories absorbed by the industry mm. but when we talk about that we are looking at uh, really the industry but around the industry you're going to create a supply chain you're going to create other industries yes. and so this multiplication will continue mm. as the industry uh, grows gr uh, puts out money that mm. money multiplies into other um, uh, chain uh, supply chains that will eventually create jobs for for ugandans so th that's one component of mm. benefit mm. the second and i must indicate that uh, the young men and uh, women and people in the project areas so hoima chikube no yabulisa that whole area where the projects uh, sit have priority mm. so if a young man from kavade you're a young man from bulisa you have priority the locals the locals mm. so go and get work 
Uh, of course, the nationals, Ugandans, still have priority. Mm. And so whether you're in Kampala, you are in, uh, in Mitiana, you can go and get a job in the industry. That's one. Second, if I have goods, I supply eggs, or I supply cabbages, or I supply all these, all these are going to be required. Mm. At some point, we'll have more than 5,000 expatriates sitting in the grub and working. They must eat breakfast, they must eat lunch, they must eat supper. At uh, Bulisa, uh, in Bulisa where we are building, the, 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 we are starting the construction of the central processing facility for Telenga. Mm. Right now, there is a, a 4,000 man camp mm. that is being constructed. That camp wow. will house 4,000 people. Mm. And at some point, it will probably be higher than 4,000. And of course, we, we are talking about employees, yes. potential employees. Employees, they will be working, they will be busy. They will mm. be busy working on facilities. So they need to be given all services, mm. from food to cleaning to all sorts of services. Uh, they will need entertainment, they will need all these things. So the idea is that uh, let's create, our, uh, let's be ready to pick these opportunities to provide goods and services to the industry. Because that's where this 11 billion is going to go. Okay. So th those are the opportunities that you're looking at. If you broadly look at them in that nature, employment mm. and provision of services. Goods and, and services. Goods. Yes. Yes, uh, was it yesterday? Yesterday was a Monday, yes. Mm. And uh, one of uh, the publications, the New Vision, mm. uh, did uh, uh, put through, uh, it publicized some of the jobs available. And I think it was one of the sister companies, Chinook, mm. that was advertising some jobs. And someone uh, did uh, get down to Barbara Kaija, mm. one of the, the bosses at New Vision, and asked, how do you expect people to get these jobs when the jobs are asking for 10 to 15 years experience? Uh, and I mean, somehow, somewhere, it, it's, it's uh, uh, trickled through my mind, so I'm putting it to you. Yeah. Uh, 10 to 15 years experience, have people already been uh, into this kind of uh, 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 preparation for such uh, opportunities coming their way? Well, we have a few people that mm. have experience. We have uh, a few Ugandans that are trained, that have been in the industry, mm. and those would fit uh, into that uh, the job description. We also have Ugandans who have worked in the industry, but outside the, the country. Oh, yeah. And many of them have been coming back uh, to, 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 to join the industry and work. Mm. But that should not uh, intimidate our people, <laughs> because the jobs that require that manner of experience are largely highly technical jobs. Mm. Uh, that, of course, if you're going to go to, to, to be a manager of a drilling rig, uh, you need to have experience mm. because it's, first of all, very expensive to have a rig. It's dangerous. Uh, it's risky. So it yeah. has to be properly managed. So for those very technical jobs, mm. it will definitely require people with experience. Okay. But the, the majority of the jobs, especially in the blue-collar category, mm. require minimal uh, skilling uh, and uh, certification. Mm. Yes, so the opportunities are still there. There's always been that uh, tag attached to countries that have uh, finally gotten the blessing of oil and gas. And that tag has always been the oil curse. In most cases, described as the oil and gas curse. Mm. I'm wondering, should we actually think at one stage that is likely to happen to Uganda? Will it become a curse that we have the oil and gas? Okay. Uh, that word is used a lot, and I think I've heard it more than I've had uh, the, the blessing <laughs> uh, connotation to a wonderful resource like this. Yeah, sure. But I, I like uh, breaking things down so that we, we, we all speak from the same uh, point of view. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, what it basically means, what the oil gas means as a, pre as a, as a, a subject, mm. is that uh, the research was conducted and it was found that uh, s for some countries, that are rich in resources. Mm. Uh, from the point they discovered through exploitation, they've had uh, negative development in all mm. human development indicators yeah. compared to non-resource rich. Mm. And then, of course, research went in to see why does this happen. And uh, certain reasons have been set out. But uh, most of these reasons are largely environmental, uh, contracting uh, uh, terms, the terms that you, contr you contract, yeah. and uh, how you use the revenue from the resource. Mm -hmm. So let's start with environmental. You must be able to have a stringent environmental regime to ensure that the resource does not destroy your environment. Mm. And uh, in Uganda, we've learned uh, lessons from 
states that probably didn't do it well, and we have one of the most stringent uh, environmental regimes. Mm. So we are sure that um, uh, the environmental standards we've set will protect our um, environment, will protect our people, will protect our, our, our flora and, and fauna. Mm. And so we've learned that lesson and we put in place a very stringent regime. So that's one way of tackling the, the occurrence of the aspect. curse. Mm. Yes. And I'll tell you one little uh, provision we have in the upstream law mm. that bans flaring of gas. Now, flaring of gas is one of the most polluting, uh, f flaring generally is mm. one of the most polluting uh, elements activities. of uh, activities of our sector. Mm. By one section in the law, we banned it and oh. we protected our environment. And it cannot happen here. No one can flare because it's criminal mm. to do it. We've made it criminal. That, that's one of the aspects. Mm. Then when we're doing the environmental social impact assessments for these projects, we have a detailed analysis. We go to the communities, we go to NGOs, we mm. go everywhere and solicit for opinion. We have international panels looking at this, and we use the standards, the highest standards that you can, you can imagine. Standard so, international. Yes. Mm. So at the end of the day, you're sure that this pipeline that I'm burying in the ground has a very excellent... Uh, social impact assessment and environment assessment and to be fine. Mm. Uh, so that, that's one element. The second element is on the contracts that we negotiate. Mm. Uh, and, and it was discovered even from the Mbeki High Panel Report that African countries were losing uh, value through poorly negotiated contracts. Mm. So you are the owner of the resource, you negotiate, and at the end of the day you're taking less. The oil companies uh, are taking everything. Mm. Now, on, on the contracts, I think it's best that I quote a third party because I, I deal with them on a daily basis. I've read them and I think they are one of the, some of the best contracts uh, on the continent because I've done comparative analysis with other countries. Mm. But uh, IMF did uh, write a report and indicated that uh, the government take of Uganda, the government take is what the government is entitled to take off each barrel that is produced was one of the highest. So it's upwards of 70%. That's a well-negotiated contract. Mm. The government of Uganda and the people of Uganda will benefit. I, even, even the aspect Th of, of the jobs coming in yes. uh, and, and giving a greater percentage to the locals, that is also yes. another great part of the contract, yes. I presume. It, it's absolutely important because mm. we've also legislated it. We've gone beyond contracting it. We've legislated it and said national content takes priority. Mm. When you're procuring, nationals have priority. The companies owned by nationals have priority. So that is one other component to ensure that the, the people have a part yeah. and participate and benefit. Mm. But the, the, the last element I wanted to look at was financial management. The revenue aspect. Yeah, the revenue aspect. Mm. So what we've done is that in 2013, uh, we enacted the two laws, the upstream and midstream laws, that regulated how we get the crude out, how we transport it, how we refine it. Uh, but we did not legislate on how to manage the revenues that come from uh, that activity, those activities. Mm. So in 2015, the Public Finance Management Act was enacted. And it has a very, very extensive provisions on how revenues will be managed. But briefly, mm. the revenues from crude oil in Uganda will not go to the consolidated fund. They will go to a dedicated account called the, the, called the Petroleum Fund. And they can only be removed from the Petroleum Fund with through appropriation of parliament for two tasks mm -hmm. one yeah for investment for future generations so we know that the resource is finite mm. but it does not belong to us alone L as a generation let, let's try to understand that maybe mm. perhaps uh, for 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 that viewer out that side the aspect of uh, Uganda Wildlife Authority mm -hmm. sees uh, revenue sharing for the locals mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, within the areas where the national parks are actually sharing the same, that is the animals sharing the same mm -hmm. locality as the people. In the aspect of oil, we are saying in the, in, in, in the realization of that revenue, it's mm -hmm. going to be placed at uh, a constant savings account, perhaps, if I, yeah. I put it up, put it right. And mm -hmm. then investment is only going to be for future uh, future, future goodness, future generations for for, for 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 that kind of sake. How does this one inch benefit directly from such invest uh, from such revenue? Is there no way the the, the, yes. the local communities are going to get something and no, maybe so a percentage? Yeah, of something? So let me let me just uh, finalize the the way the, the framework is. Mm. So you have uh, a component of this revenue mm. dedicated to 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 investment for future generations because yes. the resource 
belongs to all of us, mm. but it's this generation that has extracted it. The future generation must be able to benefit from that resource as well. So we have, we'll have an investment fund that is managed by Bank of Uganda with oversight from Ministry of Finance that will invest in low risk, uh, uh, highly rated bonds or treasury, or treasury bills, mm. and that will be for future generation, but also to grow the fund. Mm. Then another component of that uh, uh, fund, that the driven uh, that will be re realized will be dedicated to infrastructure development so it, it will be appropriated to support the con to the consolidated fund mm. to support infrastructure development yeah. and why is that is important for, for which everyone benefits exactly definitely. because we think if you have your goods you have tom tom tomatoes you have cabbage you have your cows you have eggs we want to give you a good road so that you transport them to the market yes. cheaply Mm. We want to give you a rail line that is functional, mm. so you transport. We want to give you an irrigation scheme so that you, don't, you do not have to depend on nature mm. uh, to grow your crops. So that's how the two are structured. Now, c putting all this together, I think we've put in place a very good regime mm. to ensure that uh, oil in Uganda is a blessing and not a curse. Mm. Yes. Wow. Quite interesting. We are talking, what next mm. after the FID? When we were getting started, we did get into a bit of a breakdown of what the FID is, and thus to say, the final investment decision. This was reached by a couple of uh, processes being realized, and as such, we now see we are good to go in as far as investing into the oil and gas sector, and as such, benefiting from it uh, going forward. In studio with me is Mr. Peter Mulisa, just in case you're joining us right about now. And uh, he happens to be the Chief Legal and Corporate Affairs Officer, the Uganda National Oil Company Limited. The company that uh, makes sure government is uh, directly involved, it makes sure government is participating in uh, the oil and gas business, and so much of that kind. Uh, you did make mention of something to do with uh, uh, national uh, content or maybe local content. Mm -hmm. In the aspect of uh, local content, I would wish to know which, which are the local companies? Mm -hmm. Which are the local companies in this kind of angle? Because when we talk Chinook, I think that is China, yeah. uh, China something something. Yeah. Okay, fine, we have Unok, which is Uganda National Oil Company, but uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to think that one is so much a part of the others, although yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, we have the Tanzania uh petroleum uh, the tpd uh C. TPDC. Mm. yep mm. i mean all those are not local but okay. let's try to understand which ones are the local companies in this kind of uh a description yeah, good question so <clears throat> the way we look at um, uh, local companies mm. you see in terms of um, how the contracts are given out or how the jobs are given out mm. uh, the, the the companies that have taken fid final investment decision you mm. knock total Sinoc, TPDC. These are the employers. Mm. So they are the ones that are going to spend the 11 billion. Now the companies that we talk about as Ugandan, as Ugandan companies are the mm. companies that are going to come and say, I can provide goods, I can provide services, I can provide uh, all these. Yeah. So that's, we call them contractors or subcontractors, uh -huh. you, you might say. Yes. And they all fall in different categories. Mm. So you'll find some in logistics, you'll find others in, in medical services, you'll find others in waste management, you'll find in all sectors, hotels, uh, cement producers, uh, steel producers, all these. Mm. But what we've done in the definition of a Ugandan company, <coughs> but what, we've, what, what the law says, Basically, is that uh, a Ugandan company will have priority, mm. but we also recognize Ugandan citizens and registered entities that are owned by Ugandan citizens. Because mm. not everyone operates through a company. Some people operate through Melissa and Sons uh, enterprises. That's a legal entity because mm. it's a business name. Yeah. So we must also recognize it that if Melissa and Sons. Uh, enterprises can provide eggs. There is no problem. It doesn't have to be a limited liability company or a company of any nature. It, it is a registered entity. Mm. Law firms in Uganda are generally partnerships. So even that form has to be recognized. That is a registered entity mm. uh, uh, run by Ugandans. So it should be able to participate. So all these entities, business names, um, uh, partnerships can participate. But even limited liability companies. Mm. Now what makes it Ugandan? Uh, we looked at the fact that if a company is established here, mm. it employs Ugandans, 
it is using Ugandan resources, it is Ugandan because it's contributing to this economy. Okay. It's been here, it's been paying taxes, it's been contributing to our ecosystem. Mm. We must be able to recognize it as a Ugandan, Ugandan company. company. But of yeah. course there's an element of, uh, you also have Ugandan citizens coming in as individuals. Mm. Me, I can provide this service. I'm a Ugandan. Uh, we recognize that. So that's basically what we went for. Are you an entity established here? Are you employing Ugandans? Are you adding value? To, 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 to Ugandan, uh, to, to Uganda, are you using Basically, resources Basically, is Uganda prioritized Uganda? in your activities? Then that Ab makes you more of Ugandan yeah. than what you could be. Absolutely. And, and I want to give you examples. For instance, mm. if you have a company here that uh, has been in Uganda producing cement, and it's contributed to the construction of UBC, to the construction of um, the buildings we see in Uganda. It's employing Even the Ugandans. Roads to UBC. The, yeah. <laughs> it's employing <laughs> Ugandans. Mm. The ownership may not be exactly 100% Ugandan, mm. Ugandan citizens, mm. or uh, even 50% Ugandan citizens. But it's a company that has been here, that mm. has been contributing to the economy, that is employing Ugandans. There is, it would be absolutely unwise and unfair yeah. to say this is not a Ugandan company. Okay. And so for us, we took a holistic view. Mm. Are you contributing to this economy? Are you here? Are you using our raw materials? Are you paying the taxes? Are you but if we do not go into how long or how mm. much oil or gas do we, uh, does Uganda have, mm. in case these uh, uh, deposits mm. uh, run out or run dry, mm -hmm. what next for Uganda? I mean, uh, as I indicated, oil and gas is a finite resource. Mm. And, and many minerals are like that. I mean, you, if you have copper, you mine it, and at some point it may run out. <laughs> so we have uh, so far discovered 6.5 billion barrels of crude oil 6 in place. Billion barrels. Yes. Yes. Now, based on the current technology and the the, the structure of the of the of the, the let's say where the oil sits, the terrain. Yeah. They may not use it te technical terms. Mm. <coughs> we think we'll be able to recover between 1.4 billion and 1.7 billion. That's what we'll extract and bring to the ground. That will run for probably more than 25 years. Mm. <coughs> the production. But uh, we realize that uh, for every barrel you extract, it's lost, it's, it's gone. You, you have to find a way to replace it if the production is going to continue. Yeah, sure. And we replace uh, barrels that we extract by doing exploration. So right now we have three exploration licenses. We have three, two companies running three exploration li licenses mm -hmm. trying to find more crude. Uh, and uh, right now, I think they're in the second phase of the exploration uh, uh, license. Uh, they should be able to drill and uh, tell us whether they have hit a discovery or not. Mm. Uganda National Company as well, uh, we've taken that, that obligation seriously. So we've applied for a license mm. uh, from this last uh, licensing round, and we have uh, another license that we're trying to put together with the CINUC. So we are ramping up the activities of exploration mm. so that in the next eight to 10 years, we'll be taking another upstream FID or even bringing to, to, to production mm. uh, uh, other, um, other wells. So that, that's the whole idea that uh, if we look at uh, how long it will take to finish what we have today, we have to project and start work to find more crude. You might have heard that the ministry has started work in the Kadama, Kadama Moroto yes. uh, uh, sector. Yes. Because we also have information Mm. And uh, analysis has indicated there is possibility of um, crude in that area. So once the initial studies are done, we'll go into exploration, even for that basin, the Kadam Moroto Basin. So there is still potential to mm. find more crude, but uh, through the exploration activity that we are conducting, we'll confirm if we have the crude or not. Uh, and if we find it, very good. We'll continue to produce for the next uh, 40, 50 years. Wow. Very, very interesting what this discussion is bringing to the table. And we hope as well for you that is watching us on UBC TV, it is as interesting. Uh, Mr. Mulisa, I think uh, it's this particular time that I will request you to uh, come through with uh, a conclusive remark mm -hmm. concerning the FID. I don't know what exactly you have prepared for us. I don't know how you've prepared it, but uh, just about now. I wish you could actually uh, give us a conclusive remark on the FID, the final investment decision. Oh, thank you, Kent. And uh, <clears throat> I'll look straight in at uh, my, my fellow Ugandans. And uh, I know there's a lot of skepticism 
that has uh, engulfed our generation. I, I, I'm not a sociologist, I can't explain it. <laughs> There's a lot of skepticism. Uh, people tend not to believe what uh, uh, they are told. But I, I want to confirm to you that uh, this investment is here. Mm. Uh, this oil is going to, to be produced in the 2025 first quarter, without a doubt. And the 11 billion dollars that I'm talking about is going to be invested in the next four years. It's a huge opportunity for everybody, and we need to believe that this opportunity is there. We need to make effort to participate through provision of goods and services uh, so that we get this money directly into our pockets. And the, it's possible because we have priority, the law has favored you. Uh, well, we know that you don't know, you probably don't know where to start. But uh, we are available. We are entities that uh, are funded by taxpayers' money. So feel free to disturb us. We are at your service. Uh, Uganda National Company has a website. Please visit the website. Get to us. Send us questions. Send us requests. We are on Plot 15 Useful Day. Come visit us and ask us all the questions that you need. To participate, you must register your company or your business name or your partnership uh, on the National Supplier Database. It's a very easy process. It can, can be done online. It's managed by the Petroleum Authority of Uganda. They are based in Entebbe uh, uh, on Rugard Road. Please go to them and disturb them if the system <laughs> does not allow you to register. But make sure that you register mm. to participate in this sector. And uh, eventually, of course, after this 11 billion, we see a refinery also coming up uh, for construction. It will add about 3.5 billion more in investment. Mm. And so if we start now, we learn, we participate. By the time the refinery six contractors will be experienced. So what I would really want to conclude with is that uh, <coughs> whereas the government has put in place the laws to favor you, the projects are now here after a lot of hard work uh, from the government. Now it's your turn to put your best foot forward and participate. Please, please do participate. What's the website again? The UNOC uh, website? Oh, okay. So it's www.unoc.co.ug. www.unoc.co.ug. Yes. UNOC is U-N-O-C. And yes. the rest are definitely the usual. www.unoc.co. Dot UG. Mm. Very sure <coughs> the civil society coalition on oil and gas has been following. Uh, they had a bit of issues back in the days uh, and made a bit of recommendations which I've actually learned were put into consideration even before uh, the agreement that was reached to see the FID come into place. So uh, the people downside of uh, the civil uh, society coalition on oil and gas, uh, we greet you and uh, we hope you're now happy, a, a happy entity altogether. It's been uh, Mr. Peter Mulisa, uh, the Chief uh, Legal and Corporate Affairs Officer at the Uganda National Oil Company Limited, uh, sharing and dissecting what next there is after the, uh, uh, the, the, the rich and agreement to have the FID come into place. And of course, all this coming our way, courtesy of UBC, the Ministry of uh, uh, minerals, energy and minerals, and as well, government of Uganda through the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. Until we meet again, my name is Kent. Have yourselves a good night and keep tuned for the news is coming up in a few. COVID-19 is still here with us. As Sheikh Ramadan Mubadji, the Mufti of Uganda states, let us all take the necessary precautions. Prevention is, is always better than cure. Let's not uh, go for prayers in mosques, congregational prayers, unless we are masked. Carry your own prayer ma uh, mat, sanitize at the entrance. Let's all value the gift of life. Because of the new COVID-19 circulating variants like Omicron, 
It is very important for all of us to be fully vaccinated with two doses of the same vaccine type. It's only those getting Johnson & Johnson who receive only a single dose to be fully protected. Even after vaccination, continue to adhere to all SOPs by wearing a mask properly, covering your mouth and nose, washing your hands regularly with soap and clean water, or using an alcohol-based sanitizer, maintaining physical distance of at least 2 meters from others, and avoiding crowds. Echa COVID-19. Chijakugwa. This message is from the Ministry of Health with support from UNICEF and partners. Water and environment resources are the key components to our survival. That is why we need to protect our wetlands, rivers, lakes, soil and trees. Join the Uganda Water and Environment Week for a 450-kilometer walk from Luzida Kampala to Lira City as we walk for water environment and climate change. Flag off will be at the Ministry of Water and Environment Headquarters on 3rd March 2022 through the Eastern Road and will end at Lira City Mayor's Gardens on 18th March 2022. The walk is part of the activities of the Uganda Water and Environment Week 2022. It is organized by Ministry of Water and Environment through the Water Resources Institute and Workers Association of Uganda with support from development partners. International Women's Day is commemorated on the 8th of March every year. This is a day on which the role and importance of women is focused on and also when mistreatment of women or violations of women's rights are addressed. We also have enough air. To it is intellectually engaging. And you can only become a leader when there are problems. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. The same applies to to, to Rwanda, Burundi. So what are we federating? Whether rats from another country can be, I mean, someone must be, somebody must be there to hold everybody accountable. But at the moment, we would rather deal with what we have, make it right. First of all, we as elites of Uganda, have, we have made seven the issue. I can tell him seven is not the problem of Uganda. The problems of Uganda are much deeper. We can change the next 20 presidents and we'll still be this roundabout. Deeply incisive. The different political forces that, that we have in the country, in the, in the country we, we don't seem to really have achieved that you know, minimum political consensus over certain things. Authentically symbolic and insightful. Behind the headlines, every Wednesday at 10 p.m. with Charles Sodong To. All on your public broadcaster, UBC, inspiring Uganda. Nature that nurtures our life on Earth determines the geographical surrounding that should be protected and preserved by the community. This is the time we partner with UBC and protect the environment. Our environment is a program that will showcase the importance of human responsibility in a healthy environment, that is to say, conservation, waste management and recycle, disease prevention, biogas to mention but a few. Support the program, our environment on UBC. Inspiring Uganda. This week on UBC. Oh, I was so good in mathematics. Mm. People might say she brags a lot. Yes, I was really good. <laughs> I was really good at, <laughs> at mathematics. <laughs> Things just changed and then I dived to biology. Yeah. We are people who really have the wide understanding of the available courses, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all these, you know, uh, opportunities and they talk to those students. Mm. So they are not limited or they don't regret, you know, mm. not doing something they are not good at. Okay. Because it doesn't make sense for you to force yourself to do something you Cannot, cannot do, do and then fail it an amazing episode yet again our super soul sister is Annette Nakazi mm. you know I had this mindset that if people go abroad they're going to they make money automatically as if they <laughs> they get they them uh, you know from the trees thing. you know I go for what I want and for me to go for that I make sure I surround myself with people who love to see how success or greatness looks, looks on, on me. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. 
107.3 Kampala 96.9 Mbale 95.7 Jinja 98.6 Soroti You are all covered And first of all, select a variety that you have to grow. There are very many different varieties of beans. So what a farmer grows depends on his or her objective. The nursery bed is the, is the basis of, of vegetable production. So in a year we plant three times. Basically we begin in March to um, either July or June. We want to put our onions, cabbage and then uh, tomatoes. You have to start with a good, well-made nursery bed and of course not leaving out a quality seed. Currently, the level of hybrids is going up, unlike the OPVs, because the production of hybrids is higher. a lot of water. Seeds, if you give them a lot of water, they will die. Seeds are living organisms. Before they germinate, if you give them excess water, they will die. If we are processing, this we are going to sort. We remove the beans. We remove the dark combs. And we remain with only one grade. Dark combs should be processed alone and white combs processed alone. It's that time of the year again when Rotary is changing power. In 1905, Paul Harris thought of this very exciting institution called Rotary. Presidents, incoming presidents, does your family know what you do in Rotary? Does the country, Uganda, the district, understand what you're doing in the different communities you work in? The Rotary moment is here to showcase what you have done throughout the year. Your projects, 